Okay, everybody, welcome to um, the Integral Dojo Community Call, another one of our, our many uh, community calls in our, in our series of community calls with different teachers, different, either they can either be meditation teachers or spiritual teachers or some type of facilitator or <clears throat> primarily Aikido, uh, Aikido senseis. And, and today I'm very happy to be here um, with all of you who've joined the call. We have about uh, 21 people on the call, but I'm very happy to, to be here with uh, Dan. Misisco Sensei. Uh, Dan and I have yet to meet in person, and I have yet to I have yet to feel his Aikido. Even though I, I you know, I was telling Dan a minute ago that I, you know, I've seen a couple of videos of his, and and uh, we've had a few of these interactions, and it's always uh, mm -hmm. it's always very clear that there's something uh, there's something very intriguing that I that I that I appreciate about you, Dan, and I'm looking forward to our chance to to meet in person. Anyways, welcome to another one of our calls. And uh, Dan and I are going to uh, jump into an exploration, a discussion of, of Aikido and the absolute perspective. And it's, it's, it's a topic that I chose. It's, it's, a, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but, uh, so, so Dan, so would you like to, to say something about uh, our, our topic tonight, um, Aikido and the absolute perspective? Yeah. Sort of an introduction in a way, and also uh, uh, something I like to say about it. Okay. <clears throat> and it goes sort of like this. Uh, it's not very long. Like most people who practice Aikido, I have spent most of my early years practicing with a relative perspective. It has been my observation that most people continue to do so. Let me take a moment to say something very important relative to our discussion. I am no way implying that there is anything wrong or incorrect about practicing this way. I have met many talented teachers and practitioners of Aikido who have taken their Aikido practice to an amazing level with this relative interaction. What I would like to share with everyone in my own discovery in Aikido, in Aikido that enhances both Nagi and Uke's practice by removing dualism from our keiko. And then uh, basically I said, to begin with, we have, we have to know what is meant by relative or absolute perspective, and then how are they relevant to our practice. Having a relative perspective is defining the position of, of our body by our environment. For example, I'm sitting on a chair right now in front of the fence next to a fruit tree over here. I could also say that the chair is under me, the fence is behind me, and the fruit tree is next to me. However, there's still a relative relationship. Having an absolute perspective means that we don't define our position relative to external stimuli. Through embodied consciousness rooted in the here and now, everything else is in a field of our presence, much like the gravita gravitational field that surrounds objects in space. So just sort of a little introduction there, and just kind of free talk from there. Beautiful. So I like what I like what you're saying about the field of presence. Now, and and um, I'm just trying to think of a few things that you said. You know, I, I agree with you that that um, much of what we see in Aikido, much of what we see in the world, basically, is people interacting from a relative place. That's what we yeah. do as human beings. And but it's also it's uh, there's there's a very unique case when when things do shift into an absolute perspective. And that's what I see when I, when I look at you doing, uh, you know, the, the little bit of, of, of some, some work I've seen you doing, Dang. Can you speak about what that feels like in an embodied way? Like, you know, from the absolute perspective? Uh, if, yeah, well, If it's for possible example, to put words to it. <laughs> well, I say, well, say, for example, when I first started doing Aikido, just like everyone else, you know, I was taught, okay, stand in front of your partner. Okay, if you're the Nage and Uke attacks, move to the left or the right or behind them and some kind of relationship to their position. At that point, uh, you may want to blend with them. That's one thing that's about blending, harmonize with them. Uh, Kazushi, take their center. Once you take control, then you can sort of do what you want with them. So it's sort of applied technique in right. a sense. Yeah. And I don't know if there's any other way to do this, you know, when you're first learning Aikido. And uh, so this sort of thing builds up where Nagi's applying techniques to Uke. And Uke is taking the Okimi for a while, but at some point they realize, hey, he pushes, I can push back. And you get a little bit of a tit for tat going on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's, you know, and I said, I've seen this kind of practice be taken to an incredible level. I mean, just watch, I mean, amazing the people I see in Europe, there's some people over there that when they move, it's just beautiful, you know, just like, just mm -hmm. like incredible dynamic movements, very martial at the same time, beautiful. Mm -hmm. But uh, it never satisfied me, that kind of thing. Something seemed wrong. I felt like this is what I bought into Aikido for. You know, just have a, a better way of doing techniques to people. You know, I did Tang Sudo for 12 years. You know, I could kick somebody in the head. I mean, that would solve the problem very quickly. Mm -hmm. I wasn't into that, but it just seemed like if that's what it was all about, 
why did I even want to mess with it? There seemed, I was looking for something else. And so through, you know, watching those sensei videos and practicing with different teachers, it suddenly dawned on me that, you know, wait a minute, this is, we're not doing I, techniques to people. Aikido is a actual change in ourselves. We learn to change our body so that things change around us. And little by little, my practice became so that instead of, for example, facing, when you say, okay, face your okay, that's duality. I start all my practices, I'm in the center of everything. And everybody is, at the, I have the same relationship with everybody in the, in the dojo, nothing different. The UK lines up with me in the attack. I still have that same relation as I move to another place on the mat, there's still me in the center. What happens when I do that is for some reason, the UK gets pulled into that field. Right. And as they get pulled into that field, I just change the shape of my body and the field changes. So if I go down, they go down. If I go up, they go up. And then, then, sorry, when you say they get pulled into that field, do you mean that they also shift into that field? They, they, they shift, shift into the state that you're in? They shift. I don't pull them into it. It's sort of like mm. because they're, people expect some kind of interaction. So they go to make an interaction with you or touch with you, and there's nothing there. Like, so, a, cause and effect, like a cause and effect. Yeah, they sort of right. end up in a space. And I often will use this analogy. It's sort of like a, a bird lands on your shoulder and he's very comfortable there. And you'd like to take him outside. So you walk outside, open the door and flies away. He's only there because he wants to be there. In the same way, Uke, because of their intention, finds himself in this field because their intention was to interact with you. And once they're in there, when you, you can start walking across the mat and they go right with you. And I said, I, yeah, I can't just right. talk about it. I, I go down, they go up, down. I right. call it, I, I've uh, coined the word Aiki entanglement. Beautiful. And, uh, you know what entanglement is. So, you know, that uh, what I'm doing to my own body has an effect on them, even though I'm not directly trying to do it. The only reason that they do do these movements is because of their intention and they can walk away anytime they want. Right. So I don't do techniques to people. But as long as their intention is that, as long as they're, um, what do you say, fulfilling their role with the intention to attack because it's a martial engagement. Yes. That's really important that, because, you know, it, this whole thing falls apart if the person has no intention. If they grab onto me and say, okay, throw me, I can't. Right. I, can't. I mean, I can go back to the old basics, you know, mm -hmm. which always I just don't want to do too. Right. But it really takes an intent, intent to make, and it can be very subtle at some points. Just the thought of coming at me already catches them in that field. Right. As long as they have that thought, they're caught into it. So mm -hmm. I find myself moving in a way uh, that all my movements are, uh, you know, when I raise my hand, I raise my hand. When I open my arms, I open my arms. When I bend my knees, I bend my knees. And I do it in the realm of my own center uh, perspective so that uh, it just sort of captures the person. I mean, it's hard to explain because I don't intend to capture them. It's just that that bird decided to land on my shoulder. Mm. I didn't say land on my shoulder, right? Right. And, uh, yeah, if you said land on my shoulder, then you would be the nage in a way. Yeah, you're actually, exactly. you're actually exactly. approaching them. Yeah. So it, it requires a couple of things. First of all, it requires that the UK have intention. And it's, a lot of times it's hard to get that out of people. When you spend a lifetime of having a, a Aikido techniques applied to you, you, know, you start to feel that, well, I just stand here and, and Aikido techniques are applied to me. I just grab and now he's going to apply techniques. So it's all about Nagi doing things to the UK. So if people have that mindset, that they're sort of waiting for something to be done to them. You know? And uh, I've had people that, you know, they'll attack Michelle Manichi, for example, and I go to that space in the center and they get pulled in and then they stop and they go, well, what are you going to do next? And I go, nothing. <laughs> you stopped. <laughs> Here we are looking right. at each other. How are you doing? How's your, how's your family? <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's no need for Aikido at that point. No, no. there's no yeah. need for that. Uh, that uh, you know, I mean, if, it, if the attraction was always there, I'd be walking down the street and, and people would be getting stuck to me as I walk down the street. <laughs> I mean, it requires intent. It really does. And, uh, it totally does. Yeah. So, and not just intent. I would say it requires intent, consistent intent, intent throughout the engagement and yeah. even after the engagement because it, it's not yes. over at the moment. We, it, it, it has to kind of fulfill itself. Danshin is, you know, is the, this continuous connection, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's always in an evolving stage, you know. And I see other people doing other things out there. I mean, I see people doing interesting things where they're actually pushing intent into the UK and making them do things they want without actually moving. I find that really interesting. I, I'm very cautious about stepping into the world of, uh, of uh, 
control and uh, wanting things to go my way is basically as can be. It's yeah, basically it's like, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, it still feels like I want something to happen to the other person. Exactly. And what I would really like to do is I'm minding my own business, walking down the street, someone attacks, they walk into my field of influence, you know, and I'm moving in such a way that they, I, that field of influence changes its shape. And uh, more than anything else is to protect them from falling on their face, you know, of the yeah, only beautiful. actually beautiful. making adjustments to the person, you know, so they don't get hurt. Well, I mean, since we're talking... Yeah, since we're talking about the absolute perspective, if there's agency, there's some, there's some type of, even if it's a pure, you know, a pure intention, it's an egoic agency. And as long as the ego is somehow active, we're disconnected from the absolute. It's only when the ego can relax, and that takes, some, that takes a lot of internal practice. Yeah. But it's a shift that happens when the ego relaxes, and that's when we can enter into that field. And that's when other people can actually enter in that field with us. I found two ways that I can actually, the way that I interact on a physical level with people. One is they touch me and I don't touch them back. So again, the bird lands on my shoulder. I don't do this on my shoulder to make a better connection. I stay totally relaxed. And because of that total relaxation, he lands there and stays there. Mm. And the, uh, the other one is that if I do make contact with people, I come again and suddenly I'm making contact. I make it in a way that's almost allowing for their presence or like, allowing them to be who they are. So right. it's almost like you're, uh, I sometimes get a feeling like you walk in a museum and they have this sculpture that's made from the finest glass in the world. It's so thin that if you almost breathe on it, it'll break. Mm -hmm. And as you go up to touch it, you sort of go, wow, isn't that beautiful over there? <laughs> you sort yeah. of keep your distance. And so yeah. that kind of touch also has that connective power, that uh, kind of attractive power, because it, uh, it doesn't, invade their presence it just sort of comes up next to it and it just they sort of fill the gap there you know it just sort of like well hi there you are a oh, nice place you're at and it just when you touch them that way it's almost respectful of who they are you know yeah wow there you are nice punch you know and you just sort of allow for that punch to be and you're not pushing leaning uh intruding anyway in their in their the way they've described yourself you're just appreciating it and when you do that people tend to come out you know so they just they come out of that and come out of that they become dis they disarm in a way you know all of yeah. their armoring and all of their what do you say attacking intention yeah. somehow shifts like you said into that field sure yeah i know once uh, i was at uh one of frank duran's class this is years ago and uh <clears throat> the technique was a uh, shomenuchi riminagi and he was going around demonstrating it and he came up to me and i thought he, and he looked at me i thought he was attacking so i went to attack him but he really wanted to talk to me about something. So that, <laughs> as I went to attack him, suddenly he was next to me, walking next to me with his arm around me. And like we were taking a stroll through the, I went, how do you do that? How do you turn my attack into a walk across the mat to have a discussion? And it was so natural and so beautiful, oh, you know? Nice. I said, that is just, that is Aikido, right? Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> so to turn an attack into a conversation. So the, uh, but you know, again, I think the, uh, don't let me dominate the conversation, by the way, if you have something you want to say in your own experience, you know. Well, that's great. No, I, I just, you know, just in a way to kind of frame this and then, you know, we can, we can bounce back and forth and then we'll open up the mic for, sure. uh, for people who have a question. Uh, by the way, before I kind of go into something, I want to tell, you know, if you guys, while you're listening, if questions come up, you can type, you can type it in the chat box next to uh, the window here. If you just look below the bottom, there's a, there's a bar there that says chat, click that type in your question. I'll get to those later. I'll try to get to those later. If there's not, if the, if the thread isn't too long, sometimes it's out of control. I can't really read it, but you can, you know, you guys can carry on conversations on the side that way. There's also a way to raise your hand. Um, if you look at the bottom, uh, no, if you open the chat window, there'll be a, a raise hand button over there. I think if you push the participants, there'll be a raise hand button and I will, uh, I'll get to your, your hands uh, in just a, a little bit, but just uh, as a way to kind of also frame this a little bit more, and it's kind of related to what's Dan saying, Dan is saying, but maybe to give a little bit more of a, of a definition of what, what I mean by absolute. I mean, Dan's actually talking about it, but um, for me, you know, you'll often hear Aikido is a spiritual martial art and, this, the word spirit has a lot of uh, different uh, definitions, a lot of different meanings, you know, from alcohol to ghosts to, you know, team spirit. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that we could use this word and they're all fine. They're all good interpretations. Uh, but for me, in the, in, the, in, in the terms of spirituality, the word spirit m means the absolute. 
when I'm speaking, when I use the word spirit, I'm talking about the absolute. And um, the maybe to, a little story to kind of give you guys a, a, a more succinct meaning of what 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 it means for me. I mean, there's all these terms in Zen, you know, from Buddhism and other other arts. I, you know, abs- uh, unconditional love, of course, is absolute. And in Zen, there's Zanshin and Mushin and uh, no mind and, and continuous presence and and unshakable mind and um, a beginner's mind. These are all states that you shift in that are that are absolute states. Uh, they can also be attitudes, but that's not the same thing as the as the state of of, of zanshin or, or mushin, no mind. Uh, and so, what I want to do, I'll tell a little story about uh, the the story of the greatest general in all of China. It's from you know back in the day when they were China was full of warring states, and there was this one general who took his army around. He he defeated every army in the whole country, you know, the Middle Kingdom. And uh, he proved himself again and again. He was, he was a true warrior. And uh, whenever he heard that there was another army that was getting strong, he would go and he would prove himself again. He would beat them and he would beat it. He was the greatest general in all of China. Nobody could stand up to this guy. And the last uh, general he defeated, then they were, he was marching his army through the, the, the city. And everybody, of course, was bowing down because you didn't get your head cut off if you didn't. And there was one old man sitting down, and he was sitting there um, on the side of the road. And he was kind of looking up and smiling. He wasn't bowing. He was just smiling. And it was a bit of a, you know, the general was insulted. So he jumped off of his uh, horse and pulled out his sword and went over to basically kill the guy. And he said, why, why aren't you bowing down? He says, no, no, you're the, great, you're the greatest general in all of China. But, but actually, I know one man who's stronger than you. And he lives up there on that mountain. So right away, the general said, okay, I challenge. He took his whole army, marched up to the top of the mountain. It was a monastery on the top of the mountain. Big walls, he banged on the door. Pulled out his sword. I'm the greatest general in all of China. I demand uh, anybody in, come out and face me. So he had to do it two times, three times. And finally, the door opened. Little old man walked out, monk. And he took out his sword. And he said, I'm the greatest general in all of China. I can cut you in two without blinking an eye. Long pause, the monk looked up to him and he said, I'm a Zen monk. I can be cut in two without blinking an eye. So in this sense, you know, if you think of like the, the, the archetype or if you, there's meditators here and perhaps you know this state, when you go into Mushin or no mind, there's no mind, there's no ego, there's no self. There's no self, there's no problem. If there's no self, there's no other. If there's no other, there is no fear. You can literally be cut in two without blinking an eye. And these Zen states, you know, the Samurai use these to a, to a high level, to a very high level, especially, you know, all the way up through World War II. You know, they were, you know, the old Zen saying, uh, chop wood, carry water. Well, these guys were chopping heads and carrying water. And, you know, life is, life is Leela. They did, it's, 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 it's on illusion anyway. So they live, they die, it's empty. But then Oh Sensei came along and did something different. You know, this story with the, Zen, with, the, with the monk and the general. Of course, when the general met the monk, he, he put down his sword. He, he was the bird that landed on the general's, on, on the monk's shoulder at that point. You know, he, it completely disarmed him. And he realized that there, there was a much greater, that he was, he, he was ego-driven. And he had to prove himself constantly again and again and again. And he was never satisfied because there was always the next victory that he had to gain. Whereas for the monk or from that, that state of the absolute perspective, there's nothing to gain. It's very cold. It's really cold. So, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so now Osensei came along and he actually brought those two together where, where it, you, you didn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a zero sum, a live and die, which is great. If you're going to live and die, being empty is the best way to die or the best way to kill if you have to kill, heaven forbid. Can you go back to your sister? Huh? Can you go back to your mommy? All right. But Osensei managed to transform that into a win-win situation. And he did that not by going into emptiness, but by going into oneness. And this is what Dan is talking about, that it's, you know, he could easily go empty. And as soon as the bird lands on the shoulder, chop off its head, you know, metaphorically. But in Aikido, that's not what we're doing. We're actually, we're, we're, we're resolving the conflict. We're shifting into that field where we actually return into oneness together. And that's another uh, what do you say? Another another perspective or another uh, um, uh, facet of the absolute that it's not empty, it's not non-self, but it's full, it's oneness, and that's what Osensei discovered. He realized that actually these relative boundaries that we have when we when two people bump up against each other and they create this kind of tension, this friction, this conflict. In 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 the middle of the of the conflict, there's a still point, and that and the energy and information that comes out of that still point is Aikido it leads into the resolution into wholeness. 
So that's, you know, in, in one sense, you know, yes, we are trying to move into this absolute state, for my opinion. I think Dan, Dan would maybe, um, that's certainly an orientation that I think we both connect with. And yet we need conflict. We need the duality to, to, to come into this resolution. Because if we're all, like Dan was saying, if once the intent and the energy stops, you just stand there looking at each other, smile or go off and have a coffee or whatever. There's no need for Aikido. Aikido is only necessary when we have that tension, that conflict. And um, yeah. you know, I, Aikido and the absolute perspective actually is is rel the relative and the absolute, the, the the meeting of the relative absolute and how they kind of self liberate, which was actually Dan when I heard you talking, it's like every meeting in, in a way it brought the energy, but then it would also self liberate into that yeah. state. And, you know, since a lot of times you'll hear he says things, and I think a lot of times they slip to people's you know minds. Like he'll say a lot of times he says things like. Uh, Aikido is about changing yourself, not others. And people think, oh, yeah. And they think more of a spiritual thing. But, you know, think of it as a physical thing. It's about changing yourself, yeah. not the other, right? Or, Internally, from the inside. Yeah. And, you know, one of, in his memoirs, I think one of the things he wrote that I thought was really beautiful is that, you know, he said, people wonder why I'm never defeated. He says, I'm, you know, the, the, the battle's won before it begins. You know, anyone who has it in mind to attempt me, to, uh, to attack me, is already defeated themselves. I just stand here, and this is very important, at the center of everything, and all things come to me. Beautiful. He doesn't, I don't reach out and, <laughs> just being in yeah, the Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, it's just really uh, an amazing thing. And you know, and I see what's, I see a trend nowadays. And again, I gotta be very careful, because I think all the things that are happening in the martial arts world, all the beautiful things that, I mean, I wish I could be, you know, a young kid again, and take Sistema, and, and Tai Chi, sure yoga meditation you know, i just bjj mma on and on but, you know but you know they all kind of lead to the same place so i'm not that worried about it but you know i see this trend about people thinking that if somehow you can sort of a, a, a mimic the skills of sensei then you understand those sensei and i'll just give you an example out of, pulled out of the sky for example the joe trick where you know nobody can move the joe to the side right, right? Mm -hmm. and so i'm sure there's many people out there who study a lot of different ways of doing that and they do develop a, after a while, they develop a skill and say, hey, look, I can do it, you know? Now I understand those sensei. But using a religious, and I don't like to get into religion because I'm not religious, but mm -hmm. let's uh, say that someone really wanted to be like Jesus. So they go out and they get on the water and every day they practice for a hundred years <laughs> how to walk. And one, one day they do it. They go, look, I'm walking on water. I am Jesus. You see that <laughs> the thing is that it doesn't matter. These things that, these things that came out of Osensei, these skills, I don't think, my own opinion, again, I don't know, I never met Osensei, I don't think he developed these skills out of like, okay, I do this, I do that, and if I extend this no way. way. No way. They just came because of who he was. Exactly. And, 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 was. You know, he, Jesus didn't walk on the water because he did, you know, 10 years of water walking. He saw his buddies out there and says, oh, there's my buddies, and he just walked across the water, you know? Again, exactly. I, I don't know if it's true or not, you know? So this is the way things, because it's almost like you've got this underground stream it's gushing, you know, the beautiful, beautiful spiritual stuff out, and we're trying to swim into it, and it's just pushing us out. Exactly. You know, somehow we become the stream ourselves. You know? Well, that's the thing, Dan. I think that you know, there, there, if we, you know, there can be an unconscious assumption that look, if I just practice these techniques, it will lead me to the experience that Os of Osensei. Where actually, that's not what Osensei did. He did something different, and then the techniques were an expression of who he was. So it was completely the opposite. Have you ever read Jeb McKenna's book, uh, Enlightenment is the Damnedest Thing? And there's about three books he's got out there. No. Who, who's, who's the this author? Guy is Jed McKenna. Okay. Yeah, it's called, the, the first one's Enlightenment is the Damnedest Thing. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and the, when it starts off, you're ready to throw the book in the garbage because he's saying like, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting up here in my room playing video games. He says, and downstairs, dinner's being cooked. Things are being cleaned. The whole house is being taken care of. There's lots of people here. They're all here to see me because I'm the enlightened guy. And you're going, the fuck is this guy? You know, <laughs> then, you know I was intrigued, and after I just start reading his stuff, he, you know, and someone will come up there and uh, up to the room to visit him and say something like, "I've been studying with the Mahamama Babusha, you know, for twenty years," and he said this and that, that, and he kind of, he'll just start talking to him and just cut right through all his bullshit and go, "Yeah, yeah but what about you?" You know, right? And right. Uh, and and what he tends to do is, I call it taking you to the edge of the cliff. Because in my life, the, the moments that, you know, there's moments where I have these kind of, this momentum in my, in my evolution in Aikido and my evolution in my spiritual growth. And it always takes me to the edge of the cliff. And I stand there and I know I have to step off. You know, 
I have to step off and let my ego die, right? Right. And I said, not yet. I think I'll go back and do uh, another <laughs> Mark Clark. Just, they'll be ready to jump off, you know? And this has happened right. a number of times, you know? And, uh, and so uh, in the end, you know, for all the little games we children play, you sure. know, whatever it is, we're doing Aikido, yoga, meditation, you know, like that. There's some point that you go to the edge of the cliff. And if you're not willing to step off and surrender, you know, to that, whatever it is, uh, then we're always going to be, you know, I'm, I mean, the nice thing about it, and I just came from, I may have said this the last time I was on, uh, on the thing, is that I was really depressed at one point in my life because I, I was 35 years old and I wasn't enlightened yet. I said, damn, it wasn't about the time Jesus was and Buddha was even around that age. I said, I'm behind, man. I gotta, something's got to happen quick. I was in a panic. I mean, not that really I'm crazy, but I just felt like, you know, nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be one of these guys who, you know, you know, I was at a crazy age where I thought it was important. And yeah. I was sitting on a plane and I was looking out at the clouds and, you know, not being religious. I didn't know what to do. I'm saying, and suddenly I said, okay, all right, God, please. You know, I need help. I need it so bad, please. Jesus, Buddha, all the, all the holy people in all of history, all of the universe, whatever is divine. I need support here. I just, I need just a little, little, little tiny hint that I'm on the right track, you know. Yeah. I said, will I ever get it? Will I ever get it? And I looked at all these beautiful clouds outside the thing. They're just so beautiful. And suddenly a knowledge came into me. I can't say it was a, a voice. It was just a knowledge that went, everyone gets it. And the battle is over. Everyone wow. gets it. You know, whether you get it while you're in this manifestation, right. you know, the edge of the cliff is waiting for us at the end of our life. You may Absolutely. not want to go off. <laughs> it's going it's gonna collapse you know you're gonna right, go yeah. so it's, it's it's waiting i don't i'm in no hurry i've got it we all get it you know and so it makes me be able to enjoy my life here you know and if i can do a little a little less harm if i can become a little more gentle person do a little more good in the world fine but i am no no hurry to you know to to to, to have the beads you know and to go around and be the whole uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. i'm happy well, it's, I mean, it's, 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 again, it's an external, it's an external uh, form. Just yeah. like in Aikido, we have all these forms and some of them are really beautiful forms. Some more, some less, whatever. Sure. Some are more your cup of tea, maybe not your cup of tea, but they're all yeah. external forms. Yeah. You know, it's really the essence that we're, that we're, we're, we're aiming towards. That's the whole point. It's like the, the McKenna guy says, well, okay, tell me about you. What does that yeah. mean about you? And I think everybody, I mean, when I, so when I look around Aikido and I see people, I don't think of people being like the lost or confused anymore. Everybody's finding, you know, they're doing what they need to do. They're, you know, they're the children playing in the sand, you know, and trying to find out what makes them who they are, you know. And uh, someone trying to get in there. Got a question. Over here? Yeah, yeah, oh, we, yeah. Do, we, got, we got a question up. Uh, we, we've only got one. Well, so far it's one question. So listen, we're going to start bringing in some questions. That's okay, Dan. Sure. And um, just to let everybody else know that you can type in the question or even better raise your hand because, um, because then we get a little bit more interaction. And, and Linda actually, Linda, you got two things up here. Linda, uh, I opened your mic, are you there? Yes, I am. Great, so why don't you raise Hi, your Linda. question. Say Hello, something. good to see you both. <laughs> no, good to see oh dear, you. hang on a minute, I'm gonna switch. You open the mic on my iPad. Oh, you've got fine. two. You got two devices open. I thought there so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And we'll avoid feedback with the other thing. Yeah. Great. Okay. So my question: um, Having trained, are you guys getting an echo? I am. We're not getting an echo, but we see your picture. That when this is, I'm just listening. Thank you. If you can close that one, the other one will come back on. Well, that's weird. Okay. Well, while I'm fiddling with the technology, I will. Ask. There you go. Yeah, we're with you now. Yeah. Oh, that's the one I am. Okay, I'll stop being the other one. Right. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, yeah, so my question is, uh, having trained with Ms. Sisko Sensei a few times, um, which if you get the chance, go. <laughs> uh, one of the things I've been most impressed with is feeling his ukemi. Uh, uh, it's the only way I can, the, the way I've managed to describe it in my own mind is like he has power steering. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you, you move and he moves. And, and at first it almost felt like, um, like he was anticipating and leading me through the technique. And so I messed with him a little and didn't, didn't 
Mm. I, I didn't do the technique as I was supposed to, and he was right there. I mean, he wasn't, he was just so with me. It just, there was absolutely no resistance and nothing to, to fight against. Um, and so, uh, Mrs. Sisko Sensei, could you talk a little bit about how your non-dual, non-oppositional, um, Aikido, how you, how you approach your Ukemi from that perspective? You've talked a little bit about how you are as Nage. But when you're uke, okay, how does, I don't know, this, I don't even know how to word the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is a difficult thing to say because you got this chicken and egg thing going on, right? So the, mm -hmm. the closest I come to describing what it's like is, uh, if you're familiar with ballroom dancing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have the man and the woman, and for some reason we decide that men will lead. And at first it's kind of, you know, you sort of, as you're learning the very basics, you stand there with your partner, and uh, the man will sort of initiate movement and the woman will follow and uh and so that gets going along but once it develops to a very high level the movement that the guy does is just almost a suggestion of movement and the partner the woman in this case senses that but they don't move in how we say they don't move with them they move in their own realm doing the correct movements in the right place so it looks like they're i mean they're moving together but each person could walk away from each other you see they're not bound yes. on each other she's not leaning or she's not uh, he's not really leading her around the thing she's moving if you took the guy away she could continue to do the dance if you took the woman away he could continue to do the dance so there's something beautiful when dancing is done at this level and you see the very high levels we have two independent people and uh but they move in such a way that they move together and yet they have total separation as there, so this is true harmony, by the way. You know, harmony gets confused a lot of times, just thinking moving together. But think about music. When you have harmony in music, you have to have separation. You can't have everything going together like gah, 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 gah. you have to have something doing something, something doing something, and the music that brings them together. But uh, every every and in jazz in particular, you know, any person can sort of suddenly start to feel the energy and just start. And then the other people know it. They'll back off and say, here goes the sax. He wants to do it. And they back off and, and let him do his thing. And when he's exhausted himself, he'll sort of slow down, slow down, and all of a sudden the drums will come in. There's a, but there's that separation that allows that to happen. And so the same is true with the with the, uh, the uke side. I've always loved the uke part of Aikido. I'd say it's had the biggest influence on my Aikido. Because when I reach out and I make contact with someone, I have intent. My initial contact is, is to say, here you are. I touch them, and then I'm moving the body in for whatever attack I want to do. And at the same time that I'm attacking them, I have heavy, heavy embodied consciousness. And so if they do any changes in when my hand is touching them, my hand tells my body what to do. I never use my brain to do this. My hand mm -hmm. is much better at telling the rest of my body, what to, or the, the, more, you know, the point of contact is much better at tell, tell me where to go than my, my eyes or the rest of my, of my brain is. So my hand will always tell me and it will adjust to whatever they're doing. And at the same time, there's this constant intent to come in with something else, but total relaxation. So when, when I'm in UK, along with the intent, I'm also studying myself. You know, if you were, if suddenly the uh, Nagi would walk away, I would still be in the center of everything. The only thing that turns between us two is the same in ballroom dancing. Someone has the intent. And that intent can be subtler and subtler, but it has to be there. Like otherwise you're standing there, both in the center of the universe, smiling at each other, which isn't a bad place to be. Right? So we yeah. love all, everything to be resolved to. But it, it takes a real serious, and, and you know, so often in, uh, in Ukemi, we've been taught to resist, to fight, to uh, test the other person's technique. If they're not doing it right, show them how to do it. And the problem with that is we somehow assume that it's our job to teach some, anybody anything, you know? The best that anybody can do for their nage is to be a good uke. And to be a good uke, you have to be sensitive to changes. You know, like I said, the intent always has to be there, but you have to be sensitive to changes in what's going on. I'll sometimes use a beginner to demonstrate a technique who has already no knowledge of Aikido, and I'll take ukemi for them, because why not? Whatever they do is, I can take ukemi for it, you know. And when you, allow, when you do that, it allows the nage to find themselves, for themselves, where they feel uncomfortable, where they feel unbalanced. 
instead of me telling them, hey, you don't balance here, hey, you're not strong enough, hey, you're not you're enough. No, I just do this. Who can be? It's just so flowy and so uh, adjusting everything they do that if they're bent over, they say, wow, this guy's moving so beautifully. I don't need to be bent over. Oh, I'm going to stand up straight. And hey, I can relax because there's no challenge. There's no, you know, Aikido is the art of non-resistance, but why do people think that uke is the art of non-resistance? They're both the art of non-resistance. Uke and nagi are both the art of non-resistance. And uh, if, if one is in, in that world, then it's, it messes the whole thing up, you know? I mean, it doesn't bother me when people are in that mode because I'm always in the place of non-resistance. So whatever they do, I agree with it. If, they, if I'm a nagi and suddenly they turn me into uke, I'm fine, I'm, I'm happy to be an uke. I'll, I'll take you to roll. You tell me what role you want and I'll, I'll just flow with it, you know? Mm -hmm. So then there's no resistance in whatever role I take. Maybe a little too wordy, but that's sort of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that really helped. I love the, uh, the image of the dancing that, you know, as, as Nage, as the leader, you're not dragging your partner around in a dance. The, you're you're just seeing your I side of the dance. I, I would always ask the girls so if they would lead. Because yeah. I was much better at uh, being the one who takes you gimme. <laughs> they thought it was weird, but they said, okay, you know. <laughs> and it worked out really good. <laughs> 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 so we got to change the rules about that, right? Let's go to the whole dancing world and say, listen, stop this. The guy's got to lead. Let's go back and forth, you know. <laughs> It'd be really nice, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Linda. And I hope to have the opportunity to train with you again soon. Okay. Yeah, great. So, so thanks, Linda. And we just want to let everybody else know. So we're going to go ahead and start taking questions now. So if you have any questions, if you go to the participants button at the bottom, your oh, a thing, a screen will open on the side and you'll be able to raise your hand or just type it in at the bottom and, um, and I will try to bring a question in. But then maybe while we're waiting for some questions, um, maybe because um, it occurs to me that, you know, you, you've already spoken about this. But we can, you know, this, this shift into the absolute, it is, it, it, it can be, even though when it happens, it's sudden. There's no gradual develop. There's no gradual build up to it. It's there or it's not there. But it can also be something that's gradually built up to. And, you know, in Buddhism, they talk about the relative truth and the absolute truth. And the relative, there's you and me. Relative is Aikido. The relative Aikido is me doing my Aikido on you. Yeah. And you doing your ukemi or you attacking or whatever. So that's relative and, and quite sure. often we're practicing like that. So we can do Aikido on the other person. We can do Aikido with the other person, which is kind of getting close to the ballroom dancing thing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I get really polished about how I do it and I, and I start to blend with you, but I don't necessarily, you and I don't necessarily shift into another state. There's doing yeah. Aikido on the other person. There's doing Aikido with the other person. And there's doing Aikido as the relationship, which is the third thing, which is what I think you're talking about. Which you know that's for me that's that's what happens when we shift into this absolute that not just not just you or I or, or whatever whether I'm okay or not and just holding that space or in that field but then the other person joins in that field and yeah. then and then, like you say it's, there's no agency in there there's no doing anything it's just happening the intent is there you know the the, the martial relationship is there but then it's just happening. Mm. Yeah, it's very, you know, one of the things that you see uh, doing Aikido uh, with people, and what like we see a lot of it out there, and I said it's so beautiful, is harmonizing with the other person. A lot of the Aikido the people are harmonizing, you know, and it's really beautiful, and I've done it for years, harmonizing. Sure. And uh, the difference between that and uh, uh, doing Aikido in the absolute perspective is that you don't, first of all, you can't get into this relationship of somebody you have to harmonize with. See, that is already the problem, that I want to harmonize with them. The harmony has to be there in your already you are in harmony with all things so right. that is harmony that is a greater harmony and right. so then however you move anybody that comes into your field automatically gets caught in that harmony it just happens because of, of the way you are in your interaction with everything else so when i move around, when i move around the mat i'm always moving it's almost as if there was nobody in the room and when i'm walking this way i'm walking that way when i turn i turn so right. i sometimes said one of the ways you might imagine this being done is imagine a room, you walk into this room and uh, your friend is up in this like counting tower, you know, like a glass thing up there. And he's saying, Miles, Miles, listen to me very carefully. I can't tell you what's going on, but do everything I say. And you say, okay, when I say do it, take a step forward and bend your knees. Okay. Quickly turn to the right, okay. 
Take a few more steps forward. Turn to the left. Lower your body. Extend your arm out. Raise it over your head. You know, and from his position, he's seen these people attacking you. You see, but he's right. he's timing it just right so that as you right. move, these people are just going flying all over the place, right? But you are only aware of walking around the room and lifting your arms and doing different things. So take that model and then put the people in there and still yeah. move that way. You see, yeah. this is the thing. You got you have to be able to, and, and it's a difficult thing to do because it's one of these things like this, you know, that. I have to be aware there's people around me, but I have to move as if I, you know, and not running into people, but move in my own realm, my own frame of reference, you know. I often talk of that when you're in that place, you're outside the matrix. You see it all yeah. around you, but you right. know the reality is that you are outside the matrix. And you right. make the moves right. that you want in your reality, and this affects that reality. So right. it's kind of like that, you know, that's the way it feels when I do it, you know. And, uh, and so I, trying to use these stories, you know. Well, no, what you were saying before about earlier, you were saying, and then we got a couple of questions, so I'll take, I'll take their questions in a second, but you were, you were saying that, um, you know, there's, there, there's no mental process happening. You know, you say you're just following the hand. You're, the body is doing, the energy yeah. is directing the body completely, and it's, yeah. sim it's what do you say, it's, it's spontaneous. It's actually yeah. the, the source of creativity. It's all happening without any agency. The and without any mind. much better than the mind what to do. Yeah, yeah and, and doing Aikido with another person, really like really refined choreographed blending can be great, don't get me wrong, but it's still the mind following conditions. Yeah. Whereas the shift into the absolute, the mind goes, it has to go. Sure. But you're Fishman, still highly functional. Problem, because then you got to harmonize, harmonize, harmonize. You know, when I do Randori, I yeah, just right. kind of, I'm in that place. I'm always in the same place no matter where I go. So all yeah, people right. are always around me on the outside and wherever I go, they always are on the outside. It doesn't change anything, you know. Yeah. My perspective as they're moving around me is just, you know, I'm here and they're just, I just see them shifting around me and I can walk wherever I want with the right timing. And, uh, you know, there's just this, uh, they find themselves kind of running into each other and kind of falling into holes and stuff, you know. Yeah. It's because I'm moving outside the matrix. I mean, I can't, I don't know if that makes sense, to, you know, if you, if you saw the movie The Matrix. It totally makes sense. Are you kidding? Yeah. I love it. Totally makes sense. I love it. <laughs> All right, so, so Dan, we have a couple of questions. We have one from uh, Martine Shelley in, in Sacramento, and then also from uh, Jean-Marc. Jean-Marc Wise. I'm, I'll open uh, Jean-Marc's uh, mic first. Jean, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey. Great. Uh, so, did I, I get was, the name uh, right? Yeah, Jean-Marc. Yeah, that's okay, right. I was, I was very happy to participate in the winter intensive uh, this year and uh, trained with uh, Dan Francisco sensei and, and Dan... Sensei, you had a, a profound, uh, you know, impact on on myself and, and other people in, in my dojo. Our dojo is uh, North Florida Aikikai in Tallahassee, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, what what I'm interested in is uh, to see if you had any advice in, in how to how to approach your your philosophy immediately with with beginners who are learning everything, learning everything from from scratch. There, everything is new to them. Uh, you know, basic training. It sounds to me like, though, this is something that I should have learned immediately <laughs> when I started. Uh, but then there are so many things to teach, and I wonder if you have any advice. Uh, you know, yeah, how there is a way because I think it's the way we word things. You know, for example, let's take simple Shomanuchi Ikkyo, right? And uh, you, we might. This is the way it was explained to me. Okay, the person attacks, so you raise your hands up. You, you know, you make contact, then you step forward and push them down then you push them this way you push them this way and it's all about what you do to them uh, you can just change the way that you say that you can say okay as the person is coming at you you take a step to the side and raise your arms over your head then you turn your body and you take a few steps forward then you bend your knees then you lower your arms out in front of you and you see what i'm doing is i'm describing to the beginner what they're doing to their own body and not what they're doing to the other person you know and mm -hmm. you have to work also with the beginners to tell them okay as these things happen, try to loosen your body up, you know, loosen your body up. And let, even though you're continuing this energy, you know, let kind of follow what's going along. You have to sort of learn the steps of the dance in a way, you know, before you let go of the dance, you know. And uh, so that's what I do when I work with beginners is I, I, the way I word it is very important. I don't say, you know, grab their wrist or let's say, uh, 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 what do you say? Okay. When they grab your wrist, uh, step to the side of them or step to this way. As a, what I always say is, okay, where you're standing right now in this hami, move your hami over to this position. Okay, now bring your arms in front of you. Now turn your wrists. So everything is, is reinforcing the fact that what's happening, to, what the nagi is doing to themselves 
is what's the, the result in the, is, is over mm -hmm. there in the UK. It's what they do themselves that makes that happen, not mm -hmm. what they're doing to the UK. So if you start them off like that, you're not going to create these monsters. You know, they're going to, years later, they're going to resist you, you know, because, you know, I feel so much muscle on the mat. Even these days, you know, people are 20, 30 years and they're still muscling things, you know. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I just want to give them a big hug and say, listen, there's a better way. You know, it feels good. It doesn't need the muscle. You know? And you can do it when you're 90 years old. It makes no difference. That sounds good. And, and what are the words for uke in the beginning? Oh, I think the thing that we have to teach UK to do is, first of all, is to, uh, I mean, it's not about the roles or something so much. It's to understand that UK's roles, first of all, is to continuous intent. And also, I try to get them to move from the lower body so mm -hmm. that uh, as they're coming, approaching the nage, they, they're not all muscle up in their arms. And the other thing I always tell people is that the initial contact that you make, for example, in a katata tori, uh, and I, and I, you know, you've probably seen me do this in my seminars. The initial contact you make is sort of a gentle touch to the Nagi's hand and say, oh, there you are. Now, if I just do that gentle touch, that means I can step in and punch. I can kick. I can turn this way, turn that way. I don't gnarl on that wrist and start holding and say, I got you, which is absolutely ridiculous, you know, because you're going to punch me in the face. But just to touch that hand and say, there you are. So then when they make their turn, whatever it is, it's my legs that are keeping up with them. So it's always legs for Uke, it's legs, legs, legs. Never stop those legs moving. You know, if you stop your legs moving, technique's over. Just use you keep those legs moving, moving, moving. And in a lot of the in a lot of the techniques, you're actually going as far as you can before you have to do the limbo. <laughs> right. so you, you put yourself into the limbo, you put yourself, you're almost putting yourself into those the balls. And if you do all of, if you stay in your center as you do this as as the uh, Uke, and don't kind of get all hunkered over. You'll take all your falls right over your own center. And mm -hmm. It's less dangerous that way instead mm -hmm. of being thrown across the mat, you know. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, so Jean-Marc. I, I try to demonstrate Ukemi when I'm teaching too, as you're saying. You know, yeah, I get out there and absolutely. take Ukemi from people to try mm -hmm. to get them on line with the Ukemi. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, so we have another hand up. It's uh, Martin uh, Shelley, and you just said this is the last hand that's up. So we've still got about 10 more minutes. So if anybody else has a question, this is your last chance. You've got a little bit more time to get your question in. So Martin, your mic is open. Hi there. Hey, um, Martin. Martin. <laughs> Hi, both of you. So my question is kind of uh, came up uh, when you were addressing Linda's um, comment and also just your whole way of uh, uh, beautiful and wonderful and you know I've trained with you and it is quite wonderful to feel the harmony and the flowing and all that and I, I'm wondering about the other side of things so um, as people are learning how to be more uh, receptive and sensitive um, how, how do we keep the spark and the intensity you know that what like what Miles was talking about the the, the conflict which which um, is the Aikido that we can learn from. Um, so how how can you just speak to the other side of things of how to keep that that spark or that um, so it's not just a dance. So it's mm. more than a dance. So there is that more. I mean, I understand the part about seeing where you're where you're feeling conflict within yourself or you're out of integrity with your mm -hmm. body and all that. But, but as far as that, that what Uke brings and what Nage brings, can you just speak to that other side of, of keeping things alive? Because I guess where I'm coming from is seeing people trying to practice like this and it becomes very floppy and doesn't have yeah. juice, lifeless, and there's just a lot you know, of- It comes into the two worlds of what people think Uke, Uke or uh, Ukemi is. One is you resist that person, you give them the real, or you really give them an attack, or you fly around and float through the air. There's something in the middle. It's called a skilled attacker. You know, when I attack someone, I come at them with my legs. I put my hand, I'll make a gentle touch with them. I come around and every move they make, my legs are catching up to them. I'm going in there to either give them a, a punch to the face or a big kiss on the cheek. Same thing, either one's gonna work because I'm gonna get in there. So it's not that you get gnarly when you get real. People that get gnarly are weak. They're not a good attacker. A good attacker is really soft, very soft, and their body is always responds to change. 
So, you know, when you go out there and you grab somebody really hard and they do a 10 count and you go, Ugh, and it bends you down like that. I mean, that was a terrible attack. I mean, why in the world would you put all your energy into that grip and then end up in this horrible position where you're like this, you know? When I, when I touch someone and come in or even to grab the wrist in a way that I don't try to control them, I come around with my legs. When I do the attack, I'm coming around, I'm all ready for another attack. So I'm, in the, I'm always doing continuous attack as an okay. You know, it may look soft, but I guarantee you it's a lot more dangerous than the floppy stuff or the stiff stuff. So, you know, I did Tang Sudo for 12 years, right? And Korea was the guy who originated it, actually, sort of the old sensei of Korea. And there was nothing hard about that person. His body was as soft and as gentle as a lamb. And when he did anything in his moves, they looked like he was doing simple dances. And, but when he touched you, you went airborne with that softness. So it's this confusion about, the big confusion is about uh, what is real? What's real? What's a real attack? A real attack is a skilled attack. It's a skilled uh, attack where the, the attacker is an Aiki attacker. They have Aiki skills, not an unskilled, stiff, gnarly, up muscles in the shoulders attacker. So you might ask, well, what do you do when you meet somebody like that? It doesn't make any difference. If you're training together with, some, with someone who are both, that's fantastic, right? But imagine this, imagine you're the greatest dancer in the world. You can do any dance, right? And uh, this big clotty guy comes out there, he can hurry, he's all uncoordinated. He goes, I don't know how to dance, I'm sorry, I'll never be able to dance, I'm just a big klutz. And you say, sure you can. He says, what do you mean? He says, just do any move you want. And they start to move and you just walk up and you put your arms around him and you do his dance. You do the clotty, clumsy, funny dance, right? And before you know it, you're dancing. You understand you're both, you have, you've given 90% to that person's 10% and made that 100%. So when I deal with people who are very stiff and gnarly and stuff like that, through the quality of my Nagi and Ukemi movements and the softness and life like that, I don't get in the way of that, what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Sometimes they want to resist me and I allow them to resist me and I flow off of that and take Ukemi for them, even though I'm the Nagi. You know, I'll follow whatever the game is. Whatever game they want to play, I'm with it. Because the important thing is I want to walk up the mat with that arm around that guy and say, let's get some coffee, you know? And ideally, and if you want to talk about real life, which I never talk about real fights. I'm 72 years old, and I don't think I've ever had a real fight. You know, <laughs> and I hope I never do. <laughs> but I just think that, uh, you know, we worry too much about, you know, what happens if somebody really gives you a heart attack? What if they... And, that's not what it's about. Aikido is not the practice of learning how to defend yourself against real attacks. Aikido is the process of aikification, the process of developing an aiki body. And an aiki body comes from both nage and uke. And when you develop that aiki body, you start to understand that there's no, no real attack out there that's any threat. But if people want to get out there and really like lock each other up and throw each other around, you know, I, I have no problem with that. You know, if it really makes you feel good to really see that person hit the ground like a oh, boom go yeah i did something it's okay it's not like that's wrong i'm just saying there's another way you know and uh so i've never discouraged you know any students i've had from like getting out there and having a good time you know bam 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 uh since is it okay we this year go ahead you have fun guy i wish i was young enough to have some fun too you know but uh you know it's nothing wrong with it but uh you know i think the uh you know you know at some point i think we have to say what are we doing this for why are we doing Aikido? Why did we start it? You know, and uh, so there's lots of teachers out there. And, you know, Ikeda Sensei is a great teacher, right? And Ikeda Sensei has almost an opposite approach. He's saying, you know, resist that person with all your strength. And then he shows a way to bypass that strength and go into there and soften up their body. That's amazing stuff he's doing, you know, and that's another paradigm. I don't, I'm not, I don't say don't do that. I mean, that's great. Do everything that's out there, you know. I don't know if that helped. <laughs> great martin thank you so much uh martin you there i'm still here yeah okay great yeah yeah Th thanks thanks for the question oh. thank you martin uh, listen uh so dan we're almost at the end but we got one more question you you, you got uh, sure. we may go over a few minutes so is that okay great okay so this is i'm gonna open up randy boniface mike randy's in dallas texas hey randy how you doing good how are you I have a question. I, 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 I've been in this art for many, many years, and I've seen a lot of people come and go. And many times when I question these people that leave the dojo, 
uh, my interpretation of what happened to them is that is that they reached a point in which they couldn't face something in themselves so they decided to quit uh mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that to them it wasn't that that they just uh some people give excuses or whatever you know oh i got bored because we do the same thing over and over again and i go well maybe i'm just a slow learner and i've just uh, been doing this for a long time and i'm maybe i'll get it one of these days uh, yeah. but how how do we help these people uh, it, I know when you have a class of a lot of people, it's hard to identify when those people are ready to leave. But how do we gently help them find that place where they can face whatever it is that is stopping them? You know, the main thing about anything, it's like raising children. You have to give them room to grow, you know, or, or a garden. You have to give it sunshine, water, and kind of stand back. Don't be walking through the garden stamp stepping on the roots. And I think uh, when you have a, a, a group of Aikido people, you're going to have all kinds of people that come into it with all kinds of baggage. Right. And uh, there's, there's not a whole lot, you know, the only thing that I think, uh, giving them space and giving them room to grow is important. When I end a seminar, I always end it the same way. I say, I'm going to give some advice to the teachers and senpai in this dojo. The best thing that you can do for your students is to take ukemi for them. You know, don't teach them. Don't show them where they're wrong. Take ukemi for them. Show them the level of ukemi that you can that you can adjust to anything they have. Not that their technique is correct. It doesn't matter. Is your ukemi correct? And if you can do that, if you can take, if the senseis can take ukemi for their junior students, if the senior members can, that will keep people in the dojo because they feel good about themselves. And it's not faking it. You know, who says that uh, you're faking Aikido when it works? I mean, it works in the sense of not on the street. It works in the sense that you resolve the conflict. And that's what practice is about. It's not about, you know, will it stop a guy with a machete? <clears throat> it's about how do you take two people coming together out there and somehow resolve whatever conflict, whether it's physical, emotional, you know, mental, uh, personality, whatever it happens to be that, like I said, that when you walk off that mat, you're going out to have a cup of coffee with your arms around each other. And if people come in and they don't feel that, if they feel being yelled at, no, those aren't right, you're not doing it right. Some people just aren't as coordinated as everyone else is, you know? If they start feeling like they're dragging behind and ah, uh, this is not for me, you know, if they feel like there's just this elite group that only practice with each other. I mean, I, I, this is a big complaint for me when I go to these big seminars is all these so-called elites sit in the front row and practice with each other. You know, and everybody sits, all the other people sit in the back and say, oh, someday I can get up in the front row and practice with the, with the, with the big guys, you know. I say, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> the most important people in that dojo are the beginners. The most important people are the new people. You know, be be a be an example to them. Take the ukemi, take the ukemi, take beautiful ukemi. But don't resist. Don't teach. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Great. Well, listen, Dan. So, um, uh, yeah, I want to thank you for for your time and uh, and and sharing your wisdom with us. And and I look forward to the day that uh, we actually get to meet in person. I'm looking, I hope that happens sooner rather than later. But, it's it. but it, and um, it's, in terms of what's going on with the Integral Dojo Online, you know, we have one more. Um, uh, next month, I might be doing a call. I have something that's on the books, maybe going to happen. But in October, I'm going to be doing a short uh, mini course on Aikido and the spiritual principles. Excuse me, not a mini course, a mini summit. And uh, I'll, I'm inviting a bunch of my friends, a bunch of teachers that are kind of, uh, for my opinion, they have something to say about this. And Dan, if you're available again, I would love to have you uh, jump on and, and join us for that uh, that gathering, either in, in an individual session or maybe with a couple of other teachers and doing a roundtable okay, discussion. Sure. That'd be fantastic, Ross. Thank you. Right. Anyways, um, if you're on this call, that means you're probably on my mailing list. So you will get information. So please stand by for that. Thank you very much for joining. And uh, Dan, thank, thank you so you. much. Appreciate thank it. You. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Dan, do you have, do you, do you have anything you. you want to share? Uh, you said your, your website is danmasisco.com? Uh, yeah, Dan, yeah, danmasisco.com, www.danmasisco.com. That's my website. And, uh, you know, it has all my, uh, I haven't done any blogs in quite a while, you know, and, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I got my schedule on there and stuff like that. Okay. So if people want to find, if they want to catch a seminar or something, they can find you there. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. And I got, you can get into all my videos too in there. There's a awesome. thing page where you just click into all the videos on YouTube and all that. You know. It's easier when you see things going on than the talking, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Great, right, Dan. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right, Thank everybody. You. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.